This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers. In July 1980, Shinsu Seiko Corporation employee Yukio Yokozawa presented to his peers his new invention. That same year, a patent was applied for and subsequently issued, and the world would get to see what that invention was. What they saw wasn't just a new computer, but a whole new way of using computers, considered to be the world's first handheld and laptop computer. I guess which side of the fence you're on depends on the size of your hands. <laughs> but it was certainly a breakthrough in portability and the forerunner to modern mobile computers. It was released in Japan as the HC20 and North America as the Epson HX20, as the corporation name by this point had switched to Epson. Western audiences first caught sight of it in the Comdex computer show in Las Vegas in 1981, where it stirred the attention and imagination of the crowds. And Eastern audiences too wondered at the diminutive tech at the Tokyo Data and Microcomputer Show. And here it is today, right here in the cave, the world's first laptop computer. With a story like that, I think it demands a closer look. With an unexpanded footprint of a sheet of A4 paper, a height of 45 millimeters, and weighing in at 1.6 kilograms or about three and a half pounds, this machine ushered in what Business Week magazine called the fourth revolution in personal computing. If you're familiar with the luggable PCs of the 80s, such as the Osborne One, then you'll be able to appreciate that even at 1.6 kilograms, this was a small and lightweight machine for the time. A Commodore SX64, for example, was 10.5 kilograms. That's over six and a half times heavier. But this example is a little bit different from the stock machine, as we'll discover. Most noticeably, it has an expansion unit fitted to the side of it. But even with that present, it does fit nicely into the official Epson hard-shelled carry case. All in all, it's about the size of a nice 80s briefcase. Despite its invention in 1981, this particular machine, amazingly, was still in service until late 2003, and it served its time in the German Armed Forces, specifically the Luftwaffe Division, or German Air Force, hence the German keyboard layout, and we'll see some of the modifications made for it in its military role. But let's start with the base specifications. The Epson HX20 brought together all of Epson's high-density assembly technologies of the late 70s and early 80s, such as their semiconductors, printers and liquid crystal displays to squeeze everything into such a small package. It's powered by two Hitachi 6301 CPUs running at 614 kHz each. Yes, that's kHz and not megahertz with 16 kilobytes of RAM fitted as standard, which could be expanded to 32K, as well as 32K of ROM expandable to 72K. Yes, the first laptop did have dual CPUs, but it wasn't a multi-core monster. Duties were simply split between the main or master and the slave CPUs, as shown, and they communicated over a 38400 board serial connection. Around the back is an RS-232 and a serial port to allow you to connect modems, printers, or external floppy drives, as well as an external video display. An external display not required though for operation, of course, because it's got its own built-in LCD sporting 120 by 32 pixels, and you'll have no problem picking out each pixel on that display, they're really quite chunky. Epson had a head start in this kind of display, having created some of the first LCD calculator panels. The viewing angle can be adjusted using a dial on the side, so you'll have no problem seeing the screen when you're reclined in your sun lounger, for example. Those pixels are managed by six LCD controllers, each responsible for a 40 by 16 pixel chunk of screen, and it can display four lines of 20 characters on each row. You'll see the standard ASCII character set, complemented by 32 additional graphics characters, which can be accessed by holding the graph key. The full extent of the screen memory, though, covers 255 by 255 characters, so you can think of the LCD screen as though you're looking at a larger screen through a letterbox, and then you can scroll around it like this. 
You can also address the screen by individual pixels instead of characters for simple graphics. And with the optional TV interface you could display the screen on a TV with up to four colours. Whatever it is you have on the screen, you can send it to the built-in micro printer by touching Ctrl and PF2. The built-in printer is an impact printer capable of printing 42 lines per minute. And you can hear it working away here, it still works perfectly fine. The print head is impacting with a ribbon, which you can see here, and I don't expect to get much more life out of that old ribbon. And the paper comes in rolls which tucks in here. That looks like a standard size and should be pretty easy to source if I want to replace it. Now you may be wondering why Epson thought a tiny printer was a good idea. Well one such purpose they envisioned for the device can be seen in this advert. The boss in the warehouse checking prices or performing stock takes with his HX20 is the envy of his colleagues here. And he's not using it as a laptop but a handheld even though he could just put it on the counter. I bet he drives an Audi. It does seem a little odd though looking at the layout of the machine with the printer precisely in the position where the screen size could have doubled in length. But Epson obviously decided the future of computing looked like a till roll sized printer and they even gave you the option to plug a barcode reader into it to make it even more cash register like if you so desired. On the underside we'll find a trapdoor which is where the ROMs are located. Four out of five sockets are populated here and they contain a proprietary operating system and applications consisting of Epson Basic which is by Microsoft and a monitor program, that's all you get on there. Basic of course, the basic programming language and monitor can be used for debugging. Here is the monitor program from the ROMs and that displays the CPU registers. You can see here we have A which is accumulator A, B is accumulator B, X is the index register, C the condition code register, S the stack pointer and P the program counter. That's some pretty low level stuff and you can use it to read and write to memory directly, modify those CPU registers or run code at specific addresses amongst many other things. As an example we can use the monitor program to instruct the device to use the additional memory provided by the expansion unit and those commands are handily printed on the case, albeit in German but we can understand them. So let's work through those commands now. I'm just following commands but we can try and guess what's going on here. S is the set command so I type S7E to display the contents of memory location 7E which is a hexadecimal reference. Its current value is 00, zero and I'll change that to 80. Now I think this informs BASIC that it can use the extended memory addresses to access RAM in the expansion unit. It then displays the next location and we just input a dash to move on to our next command. This time we're setting memory location 3B to a value of 82. Looking at the memory map, locations 0 through to 4D are assigned to the I.O. port. So I think what we're doing here is enabling the port or informing it to use the expansion unit attached to the port. And then we can use B or back to exit out of the monitor. That causes the machine to reset and we can see if it worked. So we go into basic and type print FRE to show the free memory on the unit. And what it shows is 29,275 bytes of free memory. That's 16K from the machine, an additional 16K from the expansion unit to make it 32 kilobytes in total. And then the overheads are deducted, giving us about 29 kilobytes of memory to play with and confirming that our expansion unit is indeed working. And this is what the expansion unit looks like, containing eight two kilobyte RAM chips along the bottom with two additional and in this case empty sockets for two more ROM chips. Reading and writing programs to and from storage can be achieved with an external tape recorder or floppy disk drives, but for maximum portability, you'd have wanted this. It's the micro cassette drive, which was originally optional with a $160 price tag, but soon bundled as standard. So early editions would have a blanking plate, which you'd remove and then slide the micro cassette player on like this. Micro cassettes were more commonly used in dictation or answering machines and were introduced by Olympus in 1969. They use the same tape width as regular compact cassette tapes but have a thinner tape and operate at half or quarter of the tape speed to achieve a recording time of 45 minutes per side on an MC90 tape. 
And what powers this neat package? Well originally it would have been a rechargeable battery pack but many of these have expired by now and they can be replaced with the equivalent which is just four AA batteries. From that you'd expect to get 40 to 50 hours of life from an 8 hour charge if the manufacturer's figures are to be believed and that's reduced to about 8 hours if you're using the built in printer. And this being the German Luftwaffe edition some custom modifications have been made to it namely a change to the charging circuit Originally you'd charge or use the unit, not both at the same time, but this has been modified to allow for that. And a 12 volt power socket has been added to the expansion unit to power a desk lamp. So in the heat of battle, you could power up a lamp to see the display, which of course isn't backlit, and keep crunching those nuclear codes. HC or HX20 was universally praised for its compact style, which still managed to incorporate a 68 key keyboard and for its long battery life, with Robert Hennessy describing it as a pure joy to use in issue 60 of Softside magazine. It's reported by Epson themselves to have sold a modest 250,000 units, and it caused other manufacturers to sit up and take notice. One such competitor, which achieved far greater success in the long run, was the TRS-80 Model 100. It benefited from a larger display in lieu of a printer and microcassette, and it had a far greater software catalogue to lean on owing to the existing range of TRS-80 computers, some of which was ported across to it. The Model 100 incidentally does have an interesting footnote in computer history in that it's the last machine to contain code written by Bill Gates' own hand. After this machine he was managing the coders and the business and not doing the coding himself. In 1982, Mark Bond of Epson's computer division in Auckland, New Zealand said, In a few years' time, Epson aimed to have their products sitting beside fridges in home appliance stores, selling as home furniture. Well, they tried to achieve this by expanding on their portable range with the PX8, which is a CPM operating system based portable computer with versions of WordStar, Calc, and Scheduler built in. It retained the microcassette, but the sliding LCD display allowed it to compete with the TRS-80 Model 100 on screen size. Then there was the PX4, which was a cut-down version of the PX8, released in 1985, and that was considered the direct successor to the HX20. And subsequently, the PX16 came along, which was an IBM PCXT compatible portable with Microsoft's MS-DOS 3.2 baked into the ROMs. But for our HC or HX20, it really is where it all began for laptop computers. Multi-purpose computing, word processing, programming, dialing up BBS boards, and in this case, carrying out commands for the German Air Force, all in the convenience of a briefcase-sized package. So what exactly were people using the HX24? Well, common uses included stock taking. By using the barcode reader plugged into the back of it, a stock take could easily be taken in a shop or a warehouse, and using the integrated printer, the results printed straight out. Also, the industry standard serial and RS-232 ports on the back made it very useful for reading from and calibrating test equipment. You could carry this around a lab, for example, and test all of your high-tech expensive equipment to make sure it's calibrated. Another very common use for these types of machines, and indeed the Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 100 as well, was journalism. Being so portable, you could easily take it to a foreign country, write your news story, and then by using a modem or an acoustic coupler, send that story back to headquarters within minutes. Epson, though, clearly had an eye on the retail sector. Its successor, the PX4, included an option to replace the keyboard with an item board, effectively converting it into a fully blown electronic cash register, and a large part of their business did go on to concern point-of-sale systems. As the competition caught up and IBM PC compatible laptops became the standard, Epson lost interest in laptops and, outside of retail, its name was strongly associated with its printer division and not laptop computers. But Epson undoubtedly played their part in the development of laptops and handhelds by being right there at the start with the first laptop computer. This, the Epson HX20. Thank you for watching and take care.